Timothy Albarino for the first time on Beyond the Paradigm. Welcome to the show. Very pleased to be here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, it's good to have you on, Tim. Um, and like I've just been talking to you briefly there off air, um, I, I know that a lot of my audience are probably are familiar uh, with who you are, and you're the author of the book Birthright, which I have read myself, which is a it's a great book. Um, and obviously you're a researcher, you're an explorer. Um, but one of the stories that I've heard you talk about, now I know you often talk about your time in Peru and everything, but as I'm from England, you have an interesting story regarding your time in England. I believe you was deported. Could you tell us about that? My very, very brief time in England, specifically in the Gatwick Airport in London. Um, when I was 18 years old, I... I I always say I got kicked out of slash dropped out of high school or got dropped or dropped out of slash got kicked out of high school because, um, well, I don't have to get into why, but I was not a, I was not a rebellious young man. I wasn't, um, I wasn't a problem for the teachers or anything like that. Uh, I just wasn't very engaged in high school. I would sit in the, I would sit in the classroom and read various works of literature that I was interested in rather than perform the scholastic tasks that uh, that were being um, presented in the classroom. Sometimes the teacher would hand in the, the homework and I would simply sign my name on it and hand it back in because I had a policy I didn't believe in bringing school home. I detested school. So, <laughs> uh, I didn't have a good relationship with school, with uh, with the scholastic world, the high school, and I was jettisoned from the system and decided that this is a, this is a part of this story that most people don't know because I usually skip over it. I always say that I dropped out of high school and moved to the Amazon, which is true. But before I went to the Amazon, I had a brief stint in Gatwick, London. Uh, in the Gatwick Airport, mm. uh, I initially did was not even thinking about going to Peru. Initially, when I dropped out of high school, I wanted to go to Scotland and Ireland, and I had a contact in Ireland, and and so my best friend and I, we we booked our tickets, and we had this three month trip planned, two and a half month trip planned. We had it all worked out, all mapped out. We were going to stay in Ireland with a friend of ours. And we were going to go up. We we're going to land in London because it was cheaper flying to London. And then we we're going to take a train up north. And then we we're going to hike the Inverness Trail. And then we were going to cross over the channel into Ireland and stay with our friend. And then we we're going to loop back around and, and go back to London to head home after the two, two and a half months or whatever it was. So this was a, a childhood dream of mine. I, of course, uh, was a huge admirer of uh, both uh, C.S. Lewis and J.R.R. Tolkien, as is everyone. And so I, I always had wanted to go to England and then up to, up to uh, Scotland and then over to Ireland. And we executed the plan. We boarded our plane. We headed to uh, London. I was 18 years old. Uh, my friend at the time, I think, was 22, I believe, Carlos Santiago. I think it was 22 uh, or so, thereabouts. And we land in Gatwick, the Gatwick Airport. And of course, we have our passports and and money and enough money. We have a lot of money, but we had enough money to get by. Remember, we're going to be staying with our friend for a while in, in Ireland. And we're walking through immigrations and we get stopped at immigrations and they sequestered us in this room with all these other immigrants except all the other immigrants were pakistanis and and africans and indians and we were the only americans in there and then they each of us individually they brought us into an interview room and interrogated us and it was a, a particular woman at the time, 
one of the immigration's officials who was interrogating me, and she was being very coy with me. She was um, asking me, what am I doing in her country? Um, and I explained to her my plans. I even had maps and everything. And I told her that the, we were going to grab a, we we're going to jump on a train and head up north to Scotland and jump on the, uh, and, uh, and hike the Inverness Trail, which had just opened up at the time, a new one. And she stopped me. She said, now, now, wait a minute. What do you mean by hike? And I said, well, I mean, you know what hiking is. And she said, no, actually, I don't. I don't know what that word means. Wow. And I said, well, it's like walking, I suppose. And she said, okay, well, this is a far distance. Where are you going to stay? I said, well, we were going to probably stay in hostels and also camp along the way. And she said, what do you mean by camp? And I had to sit there and explain to her what camping was. She was pretending that she didn't know. And she said, well, we don't, we don't hike or camp here. She said, um, maybe you Yankees do that in America. Actually, she said Yanks. Maybe you Yanks do that in America, but we don't do that here. She said, it sounds dangerous. And I said, you guys have, if I'm, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe you have walking holidays, do you not? And um, she said, no, we don't do that here. Um, that sounds dangerous. And I forget what else she told me, but I started to chuckle, obviously, because she was being coy with me and, and I'm, and I'm just sort of laughing to myself. And she leaned over and she looked at me and she said, young man, it's not a good idea to laugh at the immigrations officer. And I said, well, I'm not laughing at you. Um, I just think it's amusing that you're pretending not to know what hiking and camping is. And she got pretty upset and said, uh, you know, that these were not things that Englishmen did. These are things that Yanks did, Yankees do, but not Englishmen, basically is what she told me. Obviously, she didn't like me. I was being very polite, by the way, but she didn't, she didn't like the fact that I was a young American male, I think, was part of the problem. Um, and so she interrogated my friend, I found out, with the, with the exact same coyness and, and insulting tones, and decided that she was going to deport us the following day. So she took our passports, didn't let us even spend one day in England, and deported us the following day. And what's ironic, and perhaps providential, no doubt providential, is that had I gone to, had I succeeded in this endeavor, in, this, in, in fulfilling this dream of mine and entering into London and then going on this three-month trip in the United Kingdom, I would never have gone to Peru. Mm. And had I never gone to Peru, then, then, then there is a sequence of events that would never have happened as a consequence, a sort of domino effect in my life. And I wouldn't be sitting here talking to you right now. I'd be on a different path altogether had I not gone to Peru. So when I came home from that trip, I don't even remember really that flight back. I was just so deeply depressed. Uh, it was like, it was all a blur. When I came home and, and to make, to add insult to injury, they lost my luggage on the way home. Um, when I came home, it just so happened that I believe the following week there was my father was a pastor of a non-denominational church and it just so happened that the following week there was a gentleman who was uh, who was going to uh speak as a, a guest speaker at my dad's church who his name was Alfonso Felix and he was uh, he was an American Mexican guy, Mexican American, who was who was an who was a missionary to Peru, specifically to the jungle city of Terrapoto, which is in the Amazon basin. And my stepmother persuaded me to go back to Peru with him. 
she had been to Peru and she she persuaded me. She saw how depressed I was when I came home when I got deported from England, and she persuaded me to go back to Peru, and that's what I did. Um, and I went back with Alfonso like the following the week after he came into town. I was on a plane to Peru. And so it was very, it was very uh, providential, I would say, that I did not get into England. And I, the, you know, the door was slammed shut in my face. And that's kind of how my life works. When I'm not supposed to do something, there's, it, I'm, I'm very stubborn. So I don't, I don't get the message. Uh, it, has, it has to be, it has to be delivered to me in, in sort of a, a, undeniable fashion it's like slamming a door shut in my face and so that's that's the way my my life has unfolded but anyway that's the gatwick story you know you're probably the first person ever of the hundreds of interviews i've ever done to ask me about that well it was just uh, it's the fact that she said to you englishmen don't hike and camp i can assure you we hike and we camp i did loads of that as a child and growing up i was in the cub scouts like i said i've been in the army and i just i remember I heard you talk about it briefly and I was just gobsmacked at how they spoke to you. And the thing she was saying clearly lying, like as if she doesn't know what hiking is. I mean, you're not speaking a foreign language. We know what hiking is. It's the only time it's, in my life I've been called a Yankee. Yeah. Well, which I actually, with, I, that I, I actually, that's a term of endearment as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. It was a compliment. It's, it wasn't meant that way though. <laughs> no, it's, it, to be honest, in the UK, well, in England anyway, certainly, it is a phrase that people use for Americans. It's just, it's just something they say, um, and and they say Yanks. And I know that obviously in the states, when you, you had your Civil War, the Yankees were like from the north, weren't they? And then you mm -hmm. had the Southerners yeah. wouldn't have been Yankees. But yeah, unfortunately, that's what a lot of people refer to the Americans as. Well, I'm um, a proud Yankee. Like yeah. Happy well, to be called a Yankee. Is, this is it. No, no shame. Uh, and you know what? We get a lot of Americans visiting uh, North Wales, where I live now, and they're all very polite. I've never well, had not a all of them. with any. <laughs> well, I, I, knew, I know you probably know that a lot won't be, but the ones I've come across are very polite. And I've been to the States myself once a number of years, quite a few years ago, actually. And everyone seemed to think I was an Australian. They didn't know I was English because they they expect us to speak like that, Governor, from from London, mate. And we don't all speak like that. We all have regional accents as well. So, but yeah, the, I got asked a number of times what part of Australia I was from, and I was like, I'm not from Australia. So, there yeah. you go. But um, another question that I wanted to ask you was about the Kandahar Giant. Like, like I've had LA on here, and obviously he interviewed the um, one of the shooters, but you've interviewed the actual pilot that took this body away. That's right. Could you could you tell us what he told you? If you enjoy my analysis on these topics and would like to hear more from me, I invite you to join the El Barino Analysis Members Community, where you will gain access to my weekly private briefings, live stream Q&A sessions, behind the scenes updates on my current projects and expeditions, community features that facilitate interaction with myself and other members, early access to tickets for events I happen to be conducting, and a convenient mobile app to keep you notified and up to date on everything I publish. In addition to all this, Annual subscribers will be treated to an advanced screening of three episodes in a TV series I've been working on for several years. These films alone are worth the price of admission. The El Barino Analysis Members Community is the best way to connect with me and support my work. If you would like to become a member, you can find a link to the subscription page in the description of this video or visit theelberinoanalysis.com. I hope to see you in our community. So some years ago, maybe eight years ago, uh, maybe seven years ago, um, I was working with a gentleman named Steve Quayle, and we were producing a documentary film series called True Legends. And as part of the, as part of the content of, I believe it was, I want to say it was the last one in the series, the unholy sea episode three, the unholy sea. We featured 
uh, a, a pilot, um, a gentleman whose name I promised I wouldn't say on air, but um, we featured this pilot and we recorded him. We filmed him in silhouette because he didn't want uh, he didn't want to be seen. His mother had had uh, was listening to Steve Quayle on the radio and contacted him and said, "You need to talk to my son." And that's how we got in contact with him. And so he flew in to our studio over here in Bozeman, Montana. And um, I, I met I met the gentleman, and I was instantly struck by how. Uh, intelligent and and how um and how authentic he seemed he showed us his credentials his military credentials he was active duty and he was a he was a i believe i always say ac 130 because that's that's sort of that common uh aircraft that uh that's that's always in my mind when I think about I think, this. I think but the AC one thirty is the gunship. It's a gunship, but but yeah. it's it was probably my, my my memory fails me a little bit. It's the details are in the film, but I believe mm -hmm. it was actually a, a C one thirty that he flew yes. on this occasion. Yes. A C one thirty. But I believe he also flew A C one thirties. Um I'm pretty sure it was a C one thirty that he was flying at the time. And uh his his the story he told us was the following and i'm going to try and get the details straight it's been a long time uh since i interviewed him and the details are in the film in the uh true legends episode three the unholy sea um no i'm, I'm sorry that's wrong let me correct that true legends episode two the unholy sea episode three um is called Holocaust of Giants. So it's episode two, The Unholy Sea. You can see a trailer for it on my YouTube channel, and you'll see a little bit of the of this testimony. So the pilot told us that uh, during the conflict in in Afghanistan, um, he was he was flying missions in and out of Bagram Airfield, and he would. Specifically, he was tasked with flying high-valued assets out of Bagram Air Force Base. And those high-valued assets, he told me, were usually uh, high-level um, Al-Qaeda guys or Taliban guys, so high-level terrorists. And that was usually what he was, what he was flying out of there. Um, on this occasion... It was the, it was a, it was a routine call. They called him in to pick up a high value asset. He flies again. I'm going to say a C-130. Presumably, he flies a C-130 to Bagram to pick up the asset. But this time, something very different happens. When he lands on the tarmac, he's met at his aircraft by gentlemen who he believes were Air Force intelligence, and they came right up to him as soon as he disembarked and they said no pictures this never happened something to that effect no pictures um th this you never you were never here you never saw this something to that effect right so then they escort him over to the hangar bay and he sees the asset he has to pick up he has to load onto his c-130 and it is a it's a bulk under a large tarp and it's it's resting on a industrial pallet and he he walks up to it and he said the first thing that struck him was the odor the odor was extremely powerful he said and as he got close to it he could the tarp was covering almost the entire thing except for he could see parts of it underneath the tarp and he realized this is a body so he could see the scruff of the hair sticking out um uh, he could see the arms and legs sort of hanging over the pallet he couldn't see the mass of the body but he could see part of the head arms and legs and and again the odor was was overwhelming and 
obviously, when he walked up to the pallet, he was very curious about what, what this was. And the intelligence guys are there. And a group of who he thought were Marines were there. And he said he didn't know. They could have been special ops but or special forces guys. But he thought maybe they were Marines. And he started to engage in a conversation about the asset. And he was told that this enormous humanoid was encountered in a cave in somewhere in Afghanistan, in, in, in the region of Kandahar. And the story goes, the story that he was told is as follows. A group of, let's say, Marines, I don't know if they were mean, Marines, they might have been uh, Special Forces guys, were looking for the Taliban. And they came to a particular village and they noticed that this village was bringing gifts of food and drink and other items to the mouth of this cave. So they were depositing these gifts at the mouth of this cave. And the soldiers assumed that they were aiding, aiding, and, abetting, aiding and abetting the Taliban. That was the, the natural assumption. And they were there to seek and destroy the Taliban. And so, so they um so they decided to enter the cave the, this um platoon of let's say marines went into the cave to pursue what they thought was going to be a group of taliban taliban's um, um militants and instead what they were confronted with was an enormous man who stood I believe the estimate was 10 to 12 feet tall. Uh, he was pale skinned. They, the Marines, they commented how there was this, an odor. That's the first thing they noticed was they, they smelled a very foul odor. And then this enormous man leapt at them. I believe they said he had a spear and uh, they engaged in this, this uh, they engaged in combat with this being. Uh, they obviously were discharging their weapons and and trying to bring him down. And I believe he killed he killed one of the operators. And I think he speared the this individual. And um, eventually they were able to bring him down. And then um, they they lifted him out of there. I believe a. Uh, um, a helicopter, a large transport helicopter came in and airlifted him, the, the body of the giant, to the Air Force Base to be picked up by my pilot, by, by the pilot I was interviewing. And so um, that's the story he was told. And he observed, he personally observed some very interesting details about the cadaver under the tarp. He said that the hair was bright red. He said that the skin was pale, almost chalky white. He, he said it could have been because the, the being was, was dead, but he said it was a very strange sort of chalky, whitish, pale skin tone. The, the giant had six fingers on each hand and six toes on each foot. And he was wearing a very crude uh, sandal, I believe. I believe that's a detail he said. He was wearing some very crude footwear, but he had six toes, six fingers. Um, and he had to weigh he had to weigh the asset before he loaded it on the C-130 as protocol. And so he knows exactly how much the giant weighed. And I, and I mistakenly said uh, 1,500 pounds. But I believe the accurate number, I've said that in the past, the accurate, the accurate number is 1,100 pounds. So, uh, you know, minus that industrial crate, you're talking about a guy that weighs 800 to 1,000 pounds, 10, to, 10 to 12 feet tall, right? And he loaded, loaded him up on the, loaded the crate up into the cargo bay of the C-130 and was admonished again by the intelligence guys who he thought again were uh, air force intelligence never to talk about it no pictures it never happened and he flew the body of the giant to a base in germany 
And then he said he heard through the grapevine from some of his other uh, colleagues that the giant ultimately made its way to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio, that that was the final destination for the Kandahar giant. Uh, now, our pilot, unbeknownst to us, had decided to withhold some information in his story, some key details. And uh, he withheld these details so that he could authenticate or verify anyone else's story, if they, should they come forward. And I don't even know if L.A. Marsuli knows this, but when L.A. came forward, and by the way, I think our, this, the Kandahar giant story that we were, that I just related, that, that we were told from, from our pilot, I believe it was either 20, 2003 or 2005. I can't remember which, which year. It was 2003. I want to say it was 2003, but I can't remember if it was 2003 or 2005. He had heard an interview with L or watched uh, LA's um, documentary in, in which he interviews that gentleman that you ref you referenced who was who was a part of the uh, platoon or had something to do with with the Kandahar giant affair uh, incident and he called Steve Quayle our pilot called Steve and he was very excited and he said that guy's telling the truth I held back the these details so that it should anyone else come forward, I can tell you if they were authentic. And he said, this guy's authentic. He knows what he's saying. He knows, he knows about the giant. And obviously, either he's had personal experience uh, that, that with the giant, with the incident, or he's, he has firsthand knowledge of it that is accurate. So I believe uh, that those two incidents are the same incident the one that we reported and the one that LA reported, I believe they're the same incident. I don't believe we're talking about two different giants. I think we're talking about the same one. And uh, I have, I've encountered some military personnel over the years, um, in some cases, some high ranking guys who have, who have, let's say, indirectly, let me know that the Kandahar giant is 100% real, that that incident did occur. So uh, I, I absolutely believe that, let's, let's, let me make a logical leap here. I absolutely believe that, in logical inference rather, not a logical leap, but an inference, that there are living giants in Afghanistan, at least in Afghanistan, and that they are inhabiting the bowels of the earth, that they are moving and living in these caves. Um, this giant could not have been solitary. I mean, it could have been solitary in, in living perhaps by himself in the cave, but he can't be the only one. There have to be more. He, he had to have been either, either it was the product, this giant was the product of uh, genetic engineering, or, or there's a race of giants, living giants, still inhabiting planet Earth. Mm. And I think that, that both of those scenarios are possible, but I tend to believe there is a race of giants still inhabiting planet Earth, 10 to 12, perhaps even up to 15 foot tall guys, and that they're uh, extraordinary beings, and that they actually match the descriptions of the giants that were discovered in the mounds of America back in the 19th century and early 20th century. So these guys exist still in the world. I absolutely, I, I just want to um, reaffirm, I absolutely, I absolutely believe that the Kandahar giant story is true and has never been debunked, by the way. I can fully believe that the story is real. I remember when I first heard the story, um, can't remember if I heard LA's version or yours first, but the, the first thing I sort of thought about is because, I mean, I've served in Afghanistan and, and obviously guys come home with stories, but it's not it's not a story that guys will just, I, I can't imagine that they're just going to come home with a story and say, oh yeah, we had a firefight with a giant. 
you know, you, guys come home and say we were in firefights, you know, and we were surrounded with 60 fighters when they were surrounded by 30. Do you know what I mean? But they don't yeah. come home and tell <clears> right. people um, they've been shooting a giant. And, and not only that, I've uh, I had another guest on here. I don't know if you know him, Dr. Michael Lake. He was ex um, US Army intelligence. And he told me that in when the invasion of Iraq occurred, that the US, one of the things that they recovered was the body of Gilgamesh. Um he was, Yes, I've heard he, that. Yes. Yeah. And he was he was I mean, he's ex Army Intelligence anyway, but he was told that by a former student who's currently serving. And they'd also located a Stargate in Baghdad. In Baghdad, that's right. I, I heard that yeah. they recovered the body in Baghdad. Um, yeah. uh, Tom Horn, we actually feature that story also. We feature that story also in that, in that, uh, in that documentary series. Um, I believe that's the last in episode three. But Tom Horn told a story about how he had received images that he was able to view on his computer of that op that operation recovering the uh the body of gilgamesh or of a, or of some other giant and he actually saw the, f the photographs of military personnel government personnel carrying out a large sar sar sarcophagus out of the museum and loading it onto whatever they were loading it onto at the time i don't know if they were loading it onto a helicopter or a humvee or something and shortly thereafter, shortly thereafter, Tom's home, Tom's house burned to the ground. Uh, he tells that story. Uh, he's told that story multiple times, but he tells it in, in our documentary series. So I do believe, I, I do believe that uh, there were the remains of giants still preserved in Iraq and in, and, and in Afghanistan, it would not surprise me if part of the operation, if part of that war was to recover those artifacts. I wouldn't say the primary purpose of the operation, but I would say it as an ancillary to the primary purpose of the operation. We, we, we were very interested, in, and when I say we, I mean elements of the deep state. We're very interested in recovering those artifacts. Definitely. Um, yeah, I mean, the operation would have had, you know, various facets to it. And that's obviously one that you'd never hear about in the public domain and it'd just be laughed at. But, you know, like you said, facets of the deep state, absolutely. Because one of the things that uh, Michael Lake was saying was that obviously Gilgamesh, they would have wanted to recover that body because they believe that possibly where his remains were, there was sort of maybe some of the black magic rituals that maybe he would have performed, maybe documents or whatever, and they want to get their hands on that sort of stuff. Um, or for genetic engineering purposes yeah, to recover well. the, those bodies and and um, try and reconstitute some of those particular mm. DNA sequences for whatever reason. Uh, you know, there's always been a cult of giants mm. going all the way back to the initiation of the Masonic Lodge, which, which according to their lore, begins with Hiram Abiff and basically the Phoenicians. And the Phoenicians had a, a, a cult of giant worship. Of, <clears throat> I'm sorry, I have a cold, I'm battling through a cold here, so I apologize. Um, the Phoenicians had a cult of, of giant worship. And there's some astounding historical accounts of giants among the Phoenicians. Uh, and one of those accounts, and I'm saying this because I think this is the origin, actually, of the Kandahar giant and of the giants in America. I think it's the Phoenicians. Um, there's an account, and I wanted, I should bring it up. I should have these notes on my computer at all times because I'm always talking about this story, and I'm and I'm and I'm always wishing I, I had the the data in front of me. But there was a famous uh, Roman general. I want to say his name was Sortorius. I'm probably getting that wrong, that Plutarch writes about him, the historian Plutarch. And he says that while on campaign in North Africa, he came upon the grave of a famous giant, the tomb of a famous giant. And he disbelieved that, that there was a giant corpse within. 
And so he had his men disassemble the entrance to the tomb uh, or remove the, uh, the stones blocking the entrance, entrance to the tomb. And he went inside and to his great surprise, and this is Plutarch writing this, to his great surprise, he discovered the body of a massive giant. And I forget how large uh, Plutarch records that the giant, it was very large, it was at least 12 feet tall, if not 15. I, I don't remember off the top of my head, maybe even 16 feet. Um, and, and the general was, the Roman general was, was so shocked, he had his men immediately seal up the tomb and they paid respects to this famous giant of the Phoenicians. That's in the histories of the, of the, of the Roman campaigns. Mm. And there's so many different stories like that. You go to Sardinia and you, the, the, the legends of giants are so ingrained in, in the fabric of their culture. But sadly, it's, it's mostly the older generation who are passing away. I had the opportunity to go there and on, on several occasions and speak with the villagers and, and, and the old timers. And they all, most of them had stories of giants, dead giants. Some of them had remarkable stories. One gentleman who I interviewed, he was 100 years old, I believe, when I interviewed him, or 101 years old. I don't recall exactly how old he was. He was a, he was a very long lived man. And he was still very sharp and very talkative. And I believe I, I want to say that I interviewed him in the town of Sadara, but I don't I don't remember uh, or on a, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head here, but I don't. Um, but he told me a wild story. He said that when he was a young man, he was employed by a man by by a man who had a vineyard. And he and a bunch of other young guys were employed to work in the vineyard. And as they were working in the vineyard, they're, they're, they're tilling the soil to plant a vineyard. And as they're, they're tearing up the soil with plows and they're, you know, pulling the plows with horses at the time, they started to unearth the bodies of dead giants, the skeletal remains of giants. And he said that there were many of them in this field and that the giants were all arranged in crisscross patterns. So that you'd have a giant underneath and then you'd have another body on top. You have the a cadaver on, on the bottom and on top. And they were, were arranged in crisscross patterns and there were dozens of them. And they were very large, like I believe they were nine to 12 feet tall, somewhere in there. Let's say nine for the sake of argument. But they were, they were obviously much larger than a normal man. And again, there's dozens of them. And so when this happened, obviously they alerted the coroner and they, the, the owner of the fields received a phone call that, that uh, agents of the government were coming and that everybody had to clear up. The agents are coming and everybody had to clear out. So he said to the workers, you all need to go home right now. You never saw any of this. Agents are coming and you can't be here when they arrive. Now, I, and I wish I could remember this guy's name. I, I didn't know we were going to talk about this, otherwise I would have pulled my notes up. But this gentleman, this 100-year-old gentleman I was talking to, he said, well, I needed the money at the time, and I didn't want to get paid for just a half day. So I decided I'm going to stick around and keep working. That way, I, at the end of the day, I can get a full day's wage. So he's, he hid, and then when everyone was gone, he went back out and kept working in the field so that he could collect a full paycheck at the end of the day he said suddenly he saw all of these vans black vans pulling up to the property and all of these guys were jumping out of the vans and he said he could tell that they were government guys they're jumping out of the vans and they came over and he's kind of hiding now watching this happen and they they came over and they started to take to photograph all the bodies of the giants they took photographs of them forensic photographs and then they started loading the skeleton the skeletal remains into the vans and they also went by the way this field was in proximity of a nuragi which which is a one of those megalithic towers in sardinia so the fields in proximity to a 
Nuragi, and they went into the Nuragi, and he saw them in there, and they were examining a hole, like in the in the in the tower structure inside an opening, and they sealed it up. He watched them seal it up with stones, and I think they cemented it closed. And then you know this took a, a couple of hours, and then they eventually left the scene or he left the scene one of those two things happened that's just one of the stories that i that i heard in in um in sardinia dozens of stories like this and these are the stories that the old timers would tell you people mm. you i would randomly talk i'd be in a a, a, a tavern or something or a, or a, a um or a coffee shop or something and i'd start to engage in conversation with with some of the old timers i had uh Anna Tuveri, who was my translator, um, was with me, and I would I would engage with them in conversation, and you would come to find out that so many of them had these stories of yeah, I remember when I was a young man and I was digging a foundation for my for for a house. I was on a construction crew digging the foundation for a house, and I would suddenly we we would hit bones and we would dig up huge skeletal hands and feet, and he said. It was known, it was known to the residents, uh, the inhabitants of Sardinia at the time that oftentimes when you would find these skeletal remains of the giants, they would have, um, they would have jewelry, they'd have rings on their fingers, or they would have necklaces around their necks. And so people would get excited when they would find them and, and, and they would try and dig them out so they could see if they could recover any, any jewelry. And these are priceless artifacts, right? Uh, ancient mm -hmm. Um, rings and necklaces and bracelets of gold and silver and bronze and and it was uh, often the case that they would find some um, and uh, so these are and, and people will contend online you know armchair uh, archaeologists will contend that all these stories you hear in Sardinia these people are just confused they're digging up the bones of giant sloths that's that's what's happening or or extinct elephants or something like that and or dinosaurs well the last time i checked sloths and elephants and dinosaurs don't wear rings <laughs> they don't have bracelets sure. they're not buried with treasure and these clear these skeletal remains clearly were and and these guys told me about uh, I'm, I'm I'm shuffling through dozens of testimonies I heard. These guys told me about some of them would take the artifacts home and hide them, and then somebody from the government, when they found out, would show up to confiscate confiscate the items that they had taken from off of the the, the skeletal remains of the giants or in or in the tomb, because in Sardinia you have to this day the tombs of the giants that's what they're called to this day and the tombs are always in proximity to the towers so the tombs mm -hmm. of the giants are always in proximity to the nurage towers these two things go together this is a cult of giant worship in sardinia and the tombs of the giants there's this stupid contention again by armchair archaeologists who say those tombs were they're large they're called tombs of the giants because they're overly large and they were they were communal tombs. They were family tombs. They weren't built for one person. It was a bunch of people who were buried inside. Well, there's two things about that. First of all, yeah, sure. Nobles maybe would have repurposed those tombs to bury their families. Sure. I got no problem believing that. But two, they missed the point. Because when you go to Sardinia, you find out, and forgive me for this tangent on Sardinia, but uh, when you go to Sardinia, you find out that the tomb, the bodies were not placed inside of these tombs. There's two different kinds of tombs in Sardinia. There's, there's, uh, there's one with a large stele in front with a tiny little false doorway. I say false doorway because it's, it's like a doggy door at the bottom of this large stele, right? And it's, and it's lined with blocks, oftentimes me megalithic blocks, so it creates a chamber. And then the other kind, has a trilithon doorway, megalithic stones in a, tri in, the, in a trilithon fashion. And it's still a small doorway. You still have to duck to get into it, but it's a large, it's larger than the other style. But both of these tombs are very large inside. There's a gallery inside and it's a large gallery. You could fit, you know, probably 10 guys inside. And 
And so the contention is, okay, it is big inside, but it's not big enough. And when I say you could fit, you know, 10 guys, I mean, standing up, not laying down. I'm talking about if we were huddled inside. And the contention is, okay, these are large tombs, but they're not big enough for the body of a giant. False. I went there with my tape measure and measured these tombs, the interiors. They're plenty big for a nine to 12 foot giant, even 15 in some cases, even taking into consideration you know, the, the, the additional width, which would be twice my width or three times my width. Yes, you can fit giants inside those tombs. So those people who are contending that you can't are just ignorant, number one. Number two, they missed the point, as I said earlier, because the galleries were not built to house the bodies of giants. Rather, the giants were buried beneath the tombs and the galleries were built on top of the tombs because they were designed for what's called the right of incubation or a right of incubation. And the right of incubation was a Phoenician ritual in which, and Carthaginian, the Carthaginians were the Phoenicians, in which as a rite of passage, young men, when they came of age, whatever that was, it was younger back then than it, than it would be today. Teenagers, right? They would, or even children in some cases, maybe 12 years old, maybe nine to 12 years old. It was much, you know, you became a man a lot quicker back then than you do today. So th this rite of passage involved these, a young person who would crawl through the opening, that false door, that little doggy door in the stele. That's why it's there. They would crawl into it and you could, um, you know, a 10 year old, an eight year old, a nine year old could fit into this do the little doggy door opening. An adult like me probably couldn't at this point. Skinnier guys maybe could squeeze through, but it'd be tight. So the young people would, would crawl in probably one at a time. They would go into the gallery and then they would be sealed in the tomb. For an, for an extended period of time. And this, the purpose of this rite was, was, the idea was that they would incubate and commune with the spirit of the mighty one, the Rephaim, the Nephilim buried beneath the soil. So it was a, the, the chamber was, the purpose was communication. The purpose was to commune and to incubate in the presence of this great ancestor who happened to be a giant. Um, again, this is, a, this is a rite involving the worship, the veneration of giants among the Phoenicians slash Carthaginians. And uh, this is, there's, there, there were at one time, there were hundreds and hundreds of tombs of the giants, maybe thousands, probably thousands, because there were over 35,000 Nurage, the towers, the the uh, the megalithic towers, over thirty five thousand megalithic towers on one island, and associated with the to towers, more often than not, were the tombs of the giants, and and inside the tombs of the giants, or rather beneath the tombs of the giants, were the remains of the giants, and also in the vicinity around the tombs in Nurage towers, and so. Your Sardinia is probably ground zero for post flood giants, for, for post diluvian, for the post diluvian remnant of the Nephilim. Sardinia is ground zero. And I would expect to find, should, if we were able to go back in time, and this would be around the time of the occupation or the conquest of Canaan by Joshua and the Hebrews. I would expect to find if we, if we could go back to those days and to the island of Sardinia, clans of these nine to 12 foot tall, maybe some cases 15, but surely nine to 12 foot tall beings with red hair, six fingers, six toes, who would be tremendously strong and probably also quite violent and feral, maybe to some extent, and maybe not, maybe, maybe 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 they were quite intelligent and and uh, well educated um comparatively during that time but the the key here and i know I'm, this is a huge tangent and you sparked all this in my head with the kandahar giant story the key here is that these were 
it was definitely a Phoenician occupation in Sardinia. Definitely. The Phoenicians occupied Sardinia later on the, the, the Carthaginians, but also the Romans afterward. Um, one of the tombs of the giants, by the way, uh, that was, no, this was not a tomb. This was a sarcophagus that was opened by a gentleman who was employed. He was digging a, he was digging a, a, a foundation of a house. They hit this stone sarcophagus. They pushed off the stone lid and it was a nine foot giant inside who was dressed in black, some sort of a black robe. Um, his, his vestment was black and he had jewelry. And inside of the, inside of the sarcophagus, this gentleman told me, were coins, Roman coins, with the likeness of Antonius Pius, the Roman uh, Caesar, the Roman Emperor Antonius Pius. And so that is an indication, if that story is true, and I have no reason to doubt these guys, and they're all telling these stories, right? So something's going on. If that's true, that he found this Roman coin of Antonius Pius in the sarcophagus with a giant, that means there were nine foot giants around during the time of the Romans. Mm. Or at least giants that were maybe discovered and then venerated. Just the, their bodies were discovered and then venerated by the Romans. Just like I told you in that story of Plutarch with the Roman general who venerated when he confirmed that it was indeed this massive giant, this hero of the Phoenicians, that uh, they, he, he closed up the tomb and, and venerated the giant. Uh, so I think, I think that that race, that species, and that would not be the human species, that would be a subspecies, a, a hybrid species of some kind, that that post-Diluvian, Nephilim species still roams the earth somewhere, probably under the earth. I mean, again, re referencing the Kandahar giant story, it would not surprise me if that were true. And that seems impossible to people because we've mapped so much of the earth. But in truth, in truth, uh, much of the earth is uninhabited. Most of the earth is uninhabited still. Yeah. There's, there's habitable zones, habitable niches where human beings live. In, in great populations, but most of the earth is, is un, uninhabited. So there's remote deserts and jungles and forests um, that, that humans barely penetrate into, uh, where I think some of these things, including other interesting cryptid type creatures like Bigfoot reside. Mm. So um, that's sort of a, a that is a some anecdotal evidence that i've attached there that 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 might uh, lend some credibility credibility to the kandahar giant story it does not at all surprise me that you would still find giants living in the in the mediterranean region mm. um especially under the ground especially hiding in a cave like that I mean, looking at the terrain of Afghanistan, like I said, I've been, you could quite easily see how the giants could be living out there and hiding away because of the mountains that they've got there and the cave systems. But I mean, where where I live over here, I mean, the original name of this island before it ever was Britain or England and things like that was Albion. And Albion is a giant whose brother right. is Burgeon, um, you know, and we, we've got... I'm doing some research at the moment, going through newspaper <coughs> articles, um, you know, looking at folklore, and there's all kinds of stories of giants. I mean, you know, Jack Jack, Jack and the Beanstalk is based on a, an actual person, Jack, the giant killer, who killed a giant called Cormorant. Um, like, you know, there's, there's giants through every county of England, into Wales, into Scotland. They name them. There's, you know, you've got your giant's causeway, there's it, they have the Lord, Lord Mayor's show in London every year where they parade two giants called Gog and Magog. Obviously, biblical references there. We don't know whether Gog Magog was one giant or two giants, but when uh, Albion was renamed Britain, named after Brutus from the Trojan Wars, that's because he came over and they fought the giants. So it, it's ubiquitous, isn't it? Um, and that 
ties in nicely to really what I wanted to talk to you about is the UFO phenomena because, again, ubiquitous. These stories are coming up all over the world. Um, I've recently been looking into what's called Project Condine, which was a study undertaken uh, by the British government in 90, between 1997 and the year 2000. And it, it, it looks at around 10,000 UFO sightings and it does conclude that UFOs have an observable presence and that that was an undisputable fact. Um, now, it's been suggested in this report that they don't believe that any of these UFOs were hostile and they try to explain away the unidentified ones as being um, a phenomenon called buoyant plasma formation akin to ball lightning. And they're saying that that's the hypothesis is, is that's what creates the appearance of these black triangles, etc. And they try to say that these close Absurd. encounters, yeah, that these close encounters, you know, this, this electromagnetic fields generated by this plasma phenomena are giving people hallucinations. However, it has been said that this review wasn't subject to a peer review because this buoyant plasma hypothesis wouldn't have withstood independent scrutiny. So they did acknowledge that many of these sightings are unidentified, as I know does Project Blue Book. I think when I looked into it, I think out of the 12,618 sightings in Blue Book, 701 were unidentified. So we, so we know for a fact there's something going on. Now, in your opinion, these unidentified craft, what do you think they are? Do, do you think, what, what do you think UFOs are? Because I know everyone in Uf the UFO community, they have different views. What What's your opinion based on all the research you've done? What are they? I think very clearly UFOs constitute three things. A, many of the sightings can be explained by mundane phenomenon. Yes, that's true. And people think they see things all the time. And in many cases, it's a flock of birds or it's a, it's, a, it's a silver balloon or something like this. That's the first thing that UFOs are. The second thing that UFOs are, are experimental craft that's being tested by uh, the United States military, Air Force, and, and the Air Force of the United Kingdom and the other developed countries. Certainly, that's the case. Experimental craft and craft that's been, that's fully developed such as the TR-3B triangular, the delta-shaped craft. There's very clear pictures and footage of the TR-3Bs. Um, so those are, that's an established fact. But C, they also constitute a non-human alien phenomenon. Technology, nuts and bolts technology that is not swamp gas and that is not human experimental aircraft. I'm talking about advanced aerospace vehicles that were designed and fabricated by some other sentient species other than, other than human beings, other than the human race. Uh, Again, I would I very comfortably call them aliens. So all three of those things are true simultaneously. I'd say the, the majority of UFO sightings fall into the first category. And then I would say the least amount of sightings would fall into the second category. I would I think it's exceedingly rare to see the experimental craft and even the TR3Bs and that sort of thing. That's the rarest thing that we see in the skies. Um it is seen, they are seen, and I'm not talking about hairier, hairier jets. I'm talking about the really advanced stuff. Um, and I've, but I do believe it's much more common than, than people acknowledge that, that we are beginning to see legitimate non-human aerospace vehicles trafficking in our airspace of, of the United Kingdom, of the United States, and, 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 and indeed every nation on Earth. Uh, they... So the phenomenon constitutes, to some extent, an alien 
faction that is operating independently of any governmental or, or private aerospace organization. Now, one of the one of the criticisms that I hear all the time over here is this: it's it, it's leveled at you guys in the states. So a lot of the attitude over here is, why is it why is it always the Americans who who see the UFOs and does these crash retrievals? Well, I've got I've got an answer to that because in the Daily Mail just over a week ago. There's a whistleblower come out over here now, an ex-British paratrooper veteran called Frank Milburn, who has disclosed that one of his uh, colleagues, who was an ex-Special Forces operative in the SAS, he was actually part of a, the extremely elite E-Squadron, which was previously called the Increment. Um, I'd say the equivalent would be SEAL Team 6 over there for you guys. Now, he disclosed that in the... 1980s in northern england e squadron was dispatched to retrieve a down craft and they were told that this craft was not russian it was not american and it was not ours they got to the area and immediately recognized that this craft uh this whistleblower who has just been named as john said that it was obvious that this was non-human and that the occupants of the craft um, had left the craft. So they left a number of uh, soldiers guarding the craft and the others proceeded on foot and also on um, motorbikes or whatever, I can't remember, quad bikes, I think they said, to search for these missing pilots. Um and that was released just this, well, just last week in the Daily Mail. So as far as crash retrievals goes, it's not just obviously in the States, it's now coming to light that it's happened over here. And furthermore, yeah. in this same article, this this same gentleman, this Frank Milburn, is told about when he spoke to various RAF pilots who had, had um, basically been told to shoot down UFOs and they got within one nautical mile of these things and they released missiles on them, 27 mil cannons, which failed to do anything at all to them. And then these craft just outmaneuvered our airplanes and they were gone. Yeah. So this this yeah, this it's... this Pandora's box is open over here. And you know, it's not just in the States now that these things are coming to light. Now the notion that the majority of UFO sightings happen in the United States, and how come how come the the People are only seeing UFOs. This over the continental United States. This meme has been passed around social yeah. media. It's just patently false. Of course it is. Yeah. For for one thing, there's a more robust reporting system here in the United States, MUFON, uh, and people are more enthusiastic to make such reports here. There's a there's a much more vibrant UFO culture here in America. Mm -hmm. um, for one thing. Uh, there's just more interest in the topic in the United States than, and that's not to say there isn't all over the world, but it, there's, there's, it's part of, it's ingrained into our, into our, uh, into our culture in America to some extent at this point, but it's just patently false. People all over the world see UFOs all the time. In fact, go to Peru. <laughs> uh, they see a lot more. There's a lot more activity over the Andes in, in the Amazon mm -hmm. than anywhere in America. A lot more. So the notion is false. No, it's not that. And people, what they want to do is they want to they want to they want to draw this correlation between U.S. Uh, aerospace companies and the sightings in America. In other words, uh, and the and the, the seemingly um, much more common sightings of, of UFOs in America and, and and by doing so say, see, this is all because it's all man-made. It's not, you know, that it's aliens flying around. That's just, it's, that's just uh, illogical. It's bad information. It's bad data. Um, like I said, there are places all over the world where the frequency of UFO sightings far exceeds anywhere in America. Mm. And the Andes Mountains is one of those places I can say for sure. And the Amazon jungle. There's a lot of UFO activity in the Amazon and much more than any anything I've ever encountered anywhere else. So 
uh, it, it, it really, yes, are you going to see more experimental craft if you live in proximity to a, to like uh, a, a underground military installation, an Air Force installation, a, a um, special, special access installation? Yeah, you're probably going to see some more lights in the sky than someone who doesn't if you live around wright patterson maybe or something like that and i'm not even sure that they are testing anything in that area anymore but yeah that's just a a it's it's not true that there are more sightings in america that is just patently false and i wish people would stop uh sharing those memes and and making those comments in videos because it's just false yeah oh i i know it's false it's, uh, it's it, it baffles the mind why people say it because they're ignorant because they've not done the research. I mean, I've got plenty of, um, because they want the phenomenon to have a human explanation. They need yeah, it to have a human explanation. And so they have to associate it with the, the U S government or the U S mm -hmm. air force or something. They need to make that association because if, if it's, if the phenomenon is ubiquitous all over the world, then and much more frequent than 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 people want to acknowledge then we we have a obvious we have an obvious alien presence on planet earth mm -hmm. if that's the case yeah. and it is the case yeah the the lies surrounding this is unbelievable because i mean i i remember doing a freedom of information request over 20 years ago to the ministry of defense and they just blatantly lied to me. They just came back and said, yeah, we don't look into UFOs. That was their answer. Of Yet course. in 2011, the National Archives were released with thousands of documents. Well, incidentally, the Rendlesham Forest documents that they've gone missing. Right. Um, and I did another Freedom of Information request on a particular incident that happened in 1980, which eyewitnesses, it was a... Um, a police officer by the name of Alan God Godfrey who spotted a craft. He was actually claimed to have been abducted. And there was some corroborating stories by other police officers and a bus driver who's seen the same craft. And um, apparently two Ministry of Defence um, investigators spoke to him. But when I, when I did a Freedom of Information request to them, they denied all, again, they said, oh, no, we've no record of that. Of course. It's just constant lies. Um, you've you obviously you say aliens, right? And and Christians are going to be very nervous about that word. What what do you mean by aliens? What's your definition when when you speak about aliens? What's your definition? Well, the definition of alien. Let's be specific to sentient beings, because we could talk about microbes and use the same ter terminology. Yeah. So if we were to encounter a sentient species that was not human, a non-human sentient species, then that species would accurately be described as alien, regardless of where that species comes from. Even if they're inhabiting the inner earth, let's say, they're still alien to the human species. Yeah. So I think the term is, is, is probably the most accurate term we can use. Now there's, there's another term, extraterrestrial, which has a little bit of a it's a little bit more specific in its connotation extraterrestrial defines and again let's stay within the confines of sentient beings extraterrestrial defines a being whose provenance is not planet earth a being whose origin is not the earth that is an extra terrestrial and i don't care what the provenance of that being is i don't care if it's mars or if it's some extra dimensional world if it's narnia it doesn't matter it's still extraterrestrial that being is still extraterrestrial and uh, both of those terminologies let's let's put it this way you're not going to find that terminology in the bible obviously but the question is do you find that idea is the idea of an alien conveyed or an idea of an extraterrestrial in regard to a non-human sentient entity conveyed and the answer is unequivocally yes we encounter beings within the biblical narrative outside of the prophetic iconography outside of the prophetic encounters i'm just talking about within the narrative itself 
we find alien extraterrestrials. We call them angels. And angel, as I've said so many times in, in so many other interviews, angels, angel is a very ambiguous term. It's intentionally ambiguous, actually. It refers to um, both non-human and human agents in the Old Testament and New Testament. Angel simply means messenger. It's angelos in the Greek and malak in the Hebrew. It simply means messenger, an envoy, one who is sent. It is nondescript. It does not describe the nature of a being. It doesn't give you any information into where that being comes from. It only describes its occupation, what that being is doing, functioning in the, uh, operating the function of, a, of an envoy. That's an angelos or a malak. So, uh, but we know because of other terminology that's used in, in, in the biblical corpus, we know that these beings, the non-human members, the non-human beings that are being described as angels in the biblical text, we know that they are, their provenance is not planet Earth hmm. because of the other terminology used to describe them, the sons of God. And we, in, in Job, we read that the sons of God shouted for joy when the foundations of the earth were laid, which means that they pre-exist us. So you can't be from planet earth if you pre-exist the earth. And even if it's a, and I believe this is the case, we're seeing a reformation of the earth in the beginning of Genesis, not the initial creation of the earth, rather a reformation. It's still the case that, that the, the loyal sons of God do not inhabit planet earth. They come from the kingdom of heaven, which is not here. So that is a, those beings are accurately described as both aliens and extraterrestrials. And really, there's no biblical contention that can be made to belay that fact. That is a fact. So we're used to conceptual, conceptualizing spiritual beings that come from a spiritual realm, which kind of shields us from the more practical terminology, from the, the rational conclusion that's lying under the surface. When we say spiritual beings from a spiritual realm, there's really no difference between that and saying extraterrestrial beings that, that come from somewhere other than planet Earth. We're making the same statement there, and even alien beings, and even alien extraterrestrials. We're making the same statement. It, again, it makes no difference if the being comes from some airy fairy spiritual realm or from a some other dimensional universe. It makes no difference. They're still aliens and extraterrestrial, the good guys and the bad guys. Now, demons are specifically terrestrial that's even built into the to the etymology of the word nephilim in hebrew which the word nephilim in hebrew contrary to popular conception it's not a hebrew word is it a, it is a transliteration of an aramaic word that is elsewhere translated in the septuagint as uh, gigantes or gigantes which means giants and the earth born so the nephilim and demons are the disembodied spirits of nephilim are specifically earth born but their fathers the watchers are specifically extra terrestrial their offspring are terrestrial they are extra terrestrial they're not from the earth so this is a concept that is that is apparent in the biblical corpus and the and the extra biblical manuscripts. It was they didn't they didn't think in these terms in the Bronze Age because they were not conceptualizing other planets. But we today have this terminology, and there's there is no reason why 
we should not apply it to um, to enlighten our understanding of the things that are occurring in the biblical corpus in the narrative of scripture so i think that the there is a contention there is a reaction by i would say the majority of the christian world especially perhaps not so much catholics i would say catholics are probably better positioned um to think in these these terms but certainly among protestants and i'm not taking a swipe at protestants i myself am a, am a protestant christian but there's this this automatic rejection of the term extraterrestrial and the term alien because there's an assumption that this notion is somehow extra biblical or anti-biblical when indeed the the opposite is clearly true and i think once people once people think rationally about what's going on in the narrative in regard to these not clearly non-human entities and we even see these non-human entities coming to the earth from from some sort of an extraterrestrial realm and again people can quibble over quibble over no not extraterrestrial extra dimensional it doesn't matter not not it doesn't matter in the context of this conversation whether they're extraterrestrial or, or, or extra dimensional or interdimensional it, ma- it makes no difference they're still alien extraterrestrial i mean when i say extraterrestrial i mean if they're some from a different planet or if they're from a different alternate reality let's say an, an alternate universe um you're still dealing with the same the the, the terms are still accurate they still apply so I think we should just embrace the obvious instead of, I don't know why people have to kick against the goads. Just embrace the facts and move on. Um, and, I, and I think that part of the, part of the, let's call it the distaste for that terminology, extraterrestrial alien, it, it has to do with, uh, it has to do with the misconception, I would say, that if extraterrestrial beings exist, then the gospel of Christ is somehow untrue or incomplete. And what I mean by that is if an extraterrestrial species exists in some other world or on some other planet, then doesn't that mean that Christ that a a Christ or Christ would have had to go and die for them like he did for us and they they, there's this whole strange bizarre um thought process that unfolds for some reason when it doesn't have to there's no reason to go down that line of thinking because we already have that problem in the scriptures we already have that problem this isn't a new problem we already have it with angels here are sentient beings who I whom I designate as the elder race because they pre-exist us pre, they pre-exist us clearly and how should we describe them if not a race so the elder race our elder siblings who pre-exist us the sons of God they constitute not only a race but a civilization and these are sentient beings and these are beings who have who can who can make willful decisions about their allegiance for example and they're in the picture they're already in the story they come from an extraterrestrial world so why don't we have that same problem with angels why don't we have this problem well wait a minute if angels exist then doesn't that mean that christ would have had died for them well we have that answer don't we in the new testament we know that christ did not help or or provide a way of salvation for the angels but rather he became a man the son of god became a man to redeem mankind he is a kinsman redeemer what he did on the cross he did for us yes does it have ramifications in the universe at large yes it does but in regard to salvation, it, is, it directly applies to the human species. That's why he became a son of Adam, to redeem the sons and daughters of Adam. 
to bring back the prodigals, to bring them home, right? To bring them back to the father's house. So uh, we already have that conundrum with angels. And we have the answer. No, Christ did not die for the angels. He died for the sons and daughters of Adam. So, so we, can, we can immediately disabuse people of this imagined problem that comes with the existence of extraterrestrials. We can disabuse the Christian community of this, of this imagined paradox, of this imagined conundrum that presents itself when they think of the word extraterrestrial. Uh, it's, it's, simply, uh, we already, it's simply already resolved within the pages of scriptures because we have sentient extraterrestrials interacting with mankind who again pre-exist us and constitute a civilization, extraterrestrial civilization. Yeah. No, I agree with you, with the people who are like this line of thinking that, yeah, Christ must have to die for them. Well, no, because that shows you the actual mind because they're then thinking, well, God's under an obligation to do this. He's, he's under an obligation. Precisely right. God's under no obligation to save anybody. None. The fact that this, this is the sovereignty of God, he said that I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. So the entire race of angels there's no salvation for them, the ones that fell. And that's God's prerogative because he is sovereign. And that's right. And then if you think about it, it makes sense because we, the offspring of Adam, are living in a condition that is very different than them. They mm -hmm. see the glory of God. They understand the truth. It's apparent to them. There's no question in regard to the existence of God or the kingdom of heaven. They experience it directly. We do not. We experience it to some extent indirectly. We believe we have faith in the gospel. We have faith in the biblical narrative and that these things are true. And so the consequence for them, when they turn away, that is a willful act of rebellion and defiance, direct defiance in the face of God, knowing who he is, seeing his glory, and then choosing to willfully defy him is a level of, it, it's, a, it's a transgression that is weightier than a human being simply choosing not to believe in God because they have direct evidence. We do too in creation, certainly, yeah. but their evidence is even more direct. They, they, they have seen the kingdom of heaven right so it's it's uh but you're right it's it, it is god's prerogative prerogative to do whatever he wants in regard to whom he chooses to save and whom he chooses not to save um that is the prerogative of the king of heaven it's his kingdom we were created for his glory and he will do with us whatever he wills and that is uh, ultimately the answer as it pertains to the condition of these other non-human entities that that are out there and we don't know everything we 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 are only told a very very small sliver of reality we are only informed about a very small sliver of reality uh, that's apparent and we should be humble and, and acknowledge that that is the truth. We, the, the, we, are, we are woefully ignorant to mm. the, the deeper mysteries of the universe. And, and even, even, even in regard to science, even in regard to the human biology, just start there. Um, nobody thought that the human cell was as complex and extraordinary as it is. Nobody thought that. You know, back just a hundred years ago, people thought that the cell was a very simple thing. It was sort of a gelatin, you know, I forget what they called it at the time. Uh, nobody, nobody could have envisioned the complex machinery that's involved in one single cell, all of the constituents moving independently of one another, fulfilling a function. Um, 
nobody could have envisioned that. So now extrapolate that out to the universe. Right? Yeah. Absolutely. We have no idea I mean, what we're dealing with. We have no that, idea right. how big, yeah. how complex the universe is, how much life is there, how much consciousness is out there, and how vast the kingdom of heaven truly, truly is. Yeah. Pride, isn't it? Mankind's pride. We think we know a lot. We know nothing. We know absolutely nothing. That's for sure. And that's the problem with mankind, unfortunately. We like to think we know, and we know next to nothing, and presume we know what God's thinking when he's nothing like us. Which is but the height um, of hubris, that man would yes. presume to know the mind of God. Yeah, absolutely. Or limit, but, um, or limit his, his creativity and his creative yeah. function mm. by saying, yeah. oh, no, 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 no. God only created angels, demons, humans, and animals. Well, who are you? Who are you who know nothing of the universe? Who are we who know nothing of the universe, who are barely beginning to understand life in the physical mm -hmm. world? Who are we to limit the mind of a being that we cannot even begin to comprehend? Oh, yeah. An, in, an infinite being. Yeah. I mean, it is the height of pride. We think that we've got our Bible, which you know, we're, we're thankful for it. And that's relevant to us. That's God's word, which is unchanging. We know that. But there's so much more outside of that, which when we are resurrected and go to be with God, we will learn these things. But, you know, we're fallen. And that's the problem. We're fallen people. We can't handle most of this stuff anyway. No, no. Um, and we God can't even us... see it because we, got, we yeah. have per perceptual cataracts. That's right, yeah. Absolutely. It's like, I remember uh, David Attenborough over here saying that um, he was asked if he believed in God and he said, well, I can't say I don't and I can't say I do. He says, maybe my problem is I'm like an ant because when you're uh, a person's near an ant hill, an ant doesn't even know you're there because it doesn't perceive you. And he says, That's maybe right. I can't perceive that there is a God. That's right. And, and that is an ant. An ant. Could could never could could never even begin to conceptualize the life of a human being, mm. let alone the mind of a human being. Yeah, just just the the existence of a human being. So I think that's a very accurate analogy. Well, Tim, it's been a fascinating uh, chat with you. Um, I could talk to you all night, but. I've got to let you go and I've got to go and get myself ready for bed. But um, just before we go then, um, could you tell people, um, obviously about your book, Birthright, tell us where you can get it from and then where people can sort of interact with you. Because I know you're on Twitter and you've got your own website. You can get Birthright on Amazon and um, Amazon.com. You can get it on BarnesandNoble.com. Most of the major book vendors sell it online, not in the stores. I've never seen it in a store. Um, you can follow me on social media on, I'm on Instagram and Twitter. And obviously I'm also on YouTube and it's always the same handle. Just my name, Timothy Albrino. Uh, and I have a website, timothyalbrino.com. You can sign up for my mailing list. And also I'm just now launching a members community, the Albrino analysis members community, which is a new feature, which is a new platform, um, where people are going to get exclusive content from me. And a lot of exciting things are happening over there. So if you want to join the Elbrino, Elbrino Analysis Members Community, you can go over to timothyalbrino.com, navigate to the Members tab, and you can uh, you can sign up there. So uh, that's uh, – subscribe to my YouTube channel. That's how you can follow me. Definitely recommend people buy your book. Uh, I purchased it on Kindle because it's just – it's just instant, isn't it? You can just get it on there. And, and it's a, it is a fascinating book. Um, and you give a different perspective than what most people would probably consider. Uh, thanks for your time anyway, uh, Tim. It's been fascinating, like I said. Um, guys, I'll be back next week with a new guest. I'm Paul and this is Beyond the Paradigm.